Okay, it is live. Uh, Sergeants, will you start your recordings? PC recording is underway. Thank you for joining a virtual hearing on, today on uh, hold on, Chair Diaz. Chair Diaz, hold, hold on. on Chair. Hold on one second, Chair. Okay. Sergeant Jones, you cloud? Was not working. I got it now. Back up is rolling. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is land use testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you for your cooperation. And Chair Diaz, we are ready to go, ma'am. Good morning. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on Women NYC. I am Councilwoman Dharma Diaz, Chair of the Committee. My pronouns are her and she. This is my first hearing as a committee chair. And first to want to say that it's an honor and a privilege to serve my constituents in the city council and to be able to address solutions for serving our most vulnerable New Yorkers. I look forward to collaborating with the committee members, my colleagues and council staff to continue the committee's work related to advancing the economic mobility, social inclusion, leadership, and civic participation of New York City's women. Girls, trans, and non-binary, non-confirming individuals, I also want to thank everyone who was here to testify today. Women NYC, which is a part of NYC Economic Development Corporation, EDC, is a website designed to empower and inspire women by connecting them to services, programs, and resources. Launched in 2018, by our first lady, McCray, and former Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn, Women NYC is one one stop shop for women seeking information, resources, and tools on everything from finding a job, starting and running a business, and getting legal help to assisting to assisting in health resources and money management. And we are here today because we need to begin discussing access and resources for our communities, perhaps more than ever. In early 2020, the United States witnessed record advancement related to women's participation in the workforce. Then March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic broke out in the US as affected all industries. By April, the positive increase in the women's participation all but reversed, of course, and COVID-19 exacerbated existing inequalities experienced by women. Data that is in the early months of pandemic women and especially women of color experienced a disproportionate level of employment opportunities due to COVID compared to men. In April 2020, the national unemployment rate for Latina women surged from 4.9% in February 2020 to 20.2%. And in May 2020, Black women experienced their worst unemployment rate since the 1980s at 16.5%. Horrible. In September 2020, four times as many women as men drop out of labor force. A national employment rate reveals that 100% of payroll jobless in December 2020 were born ex excessively to women, by women. This pandemic has affected so many. I'm sure this is a story that is familiar to many of us, but it's important to recognize that women have lost a lot net, a net of 5.4 jobs during the pandemic. Nearly a million more job losses than for men. Families are hurting. There are long-term consequences of this. And it's horrible to see what leadership will look like in the near future with women being absent at the table. As of January 2020, more than 20, more than 40% of the jobs lost by women earlier than the pandemic had not returned. While data from February 2021 indicates that 40% of women aged 20 or older who have become unemployed due to COVID-19 have been out of work for more than six months. It, the city needs to address these issues and ensure that it's doing its best to support women 
and work economic equity. In, many, in, in my own district, which includes parts of Bushwick, East New York, Cypress Hills, Ocean Hill, Bronzeville, I see opportunities for movement in the city in the areas of development projects. I want to know how we can connect women to secure their in a, in a, in a place of securing good jobs. Obviously I started because I see the, the process is nowhere near what it should be. The purpose of today's hearing is to gain a better understanding of women.nyc. I, I am interested in hearing about women.nyc services and structure, the website engagement with NYC women and how it tracks success. I'm interested in how the website can better support women in low income neighborhoods and of color in particular, given the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on women, women of color, women dominated industries. Before I conclude my remarks, I'd like to acknowledge that last month was Black History Month. As yesterday, I celebrated. I celebrated Black History Month honoring former councilwoman, former assemblywoman, Annette Brown. I'm Jesus, forgive me, Annette Robinson. She was first elected as council, a school board member in 1977. She then went on to work, as I said earlier, for different levels of, of government. I was honored to have A.D. Tish Jane participate in my process yesterday. As women, we've come a long way. And before turning it back to the hearing monitor, I would like to thank my staff and committee staff for bringing us this, close, this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chair Diaz. Um, we can start by going over procedures for the hearing. Is that okay, Chair? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Chair Diaz. So good afternoon or good morning. I'm Brenda McKinney and I'm the counsel to the Committee on Women and Gender Equity at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, we want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Council member questions today will be limited to five minutes. Council members, please note this includes both your questions and the witnesses' answers. Please also note that we will allow a second round of questions at today's hearing. Um, for public testimony, I will be calling up individuals and panels. However, today we will only have one panel of witnesses. Um, so council members, if you have questions for a particular witness, please wait until that first panel is over and then we'll ask those questions. So um, as mentioned, I will call up everybody um, in the order that they will testify and then call you individually to begin. And for public panelists, once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin speaking after setting the timer. Please note also that when you are unmuted, a little box will pop up and you have to accept the unmute. Uh, as a reminder, all public testimony today will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, um, again, a brief moment and the Sarge, and wait for the sergeant's cue. And just as a reminder, um, we will accept written testimony up to 72 hours uh, after the hearing. Written testimony can be sent to testimony at council.myc.gov. So please note the email address is um, testimony at council.myc.gov. Uh, so today I will begin with the administration testimony and call on the following members of the administration to testify. Um, this is for the oath. So um, I will call on both executive director Penn and deputy director Baker. So today we have Faye Penn, Executive Director of Women.NYC, and Jasmine Baker, Deputy Director of Women.NYC. I will deliver the oath to both of you, and I will call upon each of you individually to respond to the oath. If you can please raise your right hand in Zoom. Thank you so much. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Executive Director Penn. Oh, apologies, you're still on mute. Just for the record, if we can unmute you, apologies. Yes. Thank you so much. 
And then Deputy Director Baker. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so thank you, Ms. Penn. You may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you, Brenda. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, and thank you, um, Chair Diaz, for uh, starting us off that way. Um, good morning to Chair Diaz and the members of the committee. My name is Faye Penn. I'm the Executive Director of Women.NYC, and I'm pleased to be here with our Deputy Director, Jasmine Baker, to testify about the Women.NYC initiative, how it started, and what we're doing now. Women.NYC got its start um, in early 2018 when First Lady Shirley McRae and then Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn took stock of the administration's many innovative and consequential policies that help advance working women, including universal pre-K, the salary history ban, and paid family leave, along with programs such as the game-changing Women Entrepreneurs NYC at the Department of Small Business Services. Many more career and business supports were not gender specific, but offered free skills and training in a variety of fields, including tech, film and television production, the trades, and more. So they decided to create a digital destination where women could access every available career opportunity across the New York City government ecosystem. Women.NYC would not only be a website that could help women advance in their businesses and careers, it would also be a launch pad for future initiatives. The website was launched in May 2018 and proved to be only the beginning of a much needed enterprise. Seven months later, I was hired as the first executive director based on my experience in digital publishing, women's media, public private partnerships, and entrepreneurship as a former Brooklyn small business owner. I was attracted to the role for so many reasons, but mainly this one. The past few years had seen an explosion of pay to play empowerment events touted as helping women get ahead. Power women this, lady boss that, but they did little to help the women who needed power the most. I always saw a goal of women.nyc to repackage and reframe the more helpful aspects of this movement for women who done, did not have hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars to spend on networking and coaching. When I arrived, the initiative moved from City Hall to the New York City Economic Development Corporation, a hospitable place because of its role in equitably seeding growth and new jobs. I was very fortunate that the truly amazing Jasmine Baker Taddeo joined us in July 2019 from a digital communications role at Empire State Development Corporation. We are the only two full-time staff members on this initiative. 2019 was a busy year. We launched Shop Women Own, a partnership with American Express and WeNYC to promote shopping at women-owned businesses in New York City. In partnership with Google and the Brooklyn Public Library, we also taught 24 New York City mothers JavaScript coding for free with childcare provided via a New York City cohort of mother coders, a San Francisco area-based tech training program for moms. In September 2019, we headed to the Bronx Library Center with the First Lady to launch our signature program, Ask for More. This partnership with the American Association of University Women sought to enroll 10,000 New York City women in in-person and online salary negotiation training. Until COVID-19 put the program on pause, we held regular workshops at libraries, colleges, and universities in all five boroughs and in collaboration with organizations, including the Society of Hispanic Engineers, um, the, I'm sorry, the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, the NAACP, the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, the Grace Institute, and many more. We and our volunteer facilitators taught women from all backgrounds how to fight the gender pay gap by knowing their value and asserting it to current and future employers in a systematic data-driven way. To date, we have 6,000 workshop enrollees for the negotiation training in person and online. And pre-COVID, we hosted 23 in-person workshops. According to survey data, they attracted a diverse set of attendees, 34% Black, 20% Latinx, 14% Asian. Many of them told us they had never negotiated a salary offer before. One participant, an operations manager, was prepared to accept a $60,000 salary on a new job offer, but decided after taking the workshop to hold firm at 80,000. She called me the next day to tell me she got the job and the salary she wanted. While our in-person workshops remain on hold, 
We are exploring ways to continue this very successful partnership with the AAUW. In October 2019, we launched our 30 page guide to free and low cost tech training in New York City, accompanied by an op ed I wrote in the New York Daily News entitled Getting Women All In on New York City's Tech Boom. Our goal was to help more women explore high growth and well paid fields dominated by men front end web coding, data science and analysis, and cybersecurity. We also held a NYCHA meet and greet with around 70 women to find out how women.nyc might be able to support them in their careers and businesses. We met with fashion marketers, construction workers, catering entrepreneurs, healthcare providers, and at least one truck driver. They asked us for more mentorship, networking, and training opportunities. In February 2020, EDC's research team published a report on the economic vulnerability of women ages 50 plus, which looks at the many ways systemic sexism in the workplace and increasing, increased caregiving demands contribute to financial vulnerability for women over time. Not only are women more likely to, than men to retire with fewer assets, they face a wage gap that grows as they age. However, one bright, bright spot for aging women is entrepreneurship. And with that knowledge, women.nyc announced New Venture 50 Plus, an entrepreneurial boot camp for women 50 and up with our partners at WeNYC. Applications are currently open until March 8th for our third cohort beginning March 18th. And to date, 44 women have successfully graduated the boot camp. It's hard to believe that around a year ago, we were still planning a busy calendar of March events for Women's History Month while hearing about an ominous virus heading our city's way. Like many city programs, uh, COVID's effects were deeply felt by women.nyc. Our in-person salary negotiation workshops ended, our collaborations with other agencies were put on pause and our in-person events were canceled. At the same time, as uh, Chair Diaz so eloquently laid out, the need to help women in the workforce has become ever more urgent. We have all seen the deeply troubling job loss numbers of a pandemic that has landed hardest on women of color. As we geared up for post-pandemic recovery, our strategy shifted to external outreach and planning for 2021 with an overarching focus on forging professional connections and supporting women in the workplace. In March, 2020, we updated our tech training guide to feature all online courses to help New Yorkers gain marketable tech skills while quarantining at home. We also rolled out a COVID-19 resource guide identifying helpful information and volunteer opportunities for New Yorkers in need and those looking to lend a helping hand. Starting in May 2020, we hosted a series of virtual women's leadership roundtables designed to surface equity-driven recovery ideas for COVID-19 in the areas of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, workforce development, food and hospitality, philanthropy, public policy, and age equity. The roundtables were attended by various nonprofits, public sector, and academic thought leaders, as well as city agency representatives. We also used our social platforms to highlight New York City women who are really showing up for their communities during COVID-19 by opening neighborhood fridges, distributing hygiene kits and mobile showers to struggling New Yorkers, providing free therapy to first responders, and reaffirming our city's collective spirit with the Love Notes to New York City campaign. The pandemic also inspired us to reimagine our work. Given funding challenges, what could we do? What resources could we marshal? to help women who are not only overwhelmed by life's demands, but more in need of career support than ever. We came up with two key areas of focus, the childcare crisis and the network gap. The Childcare Innovation Initiative is a new cross-departmental team at EDC dedicated to closing the data gap on how New Yorkers have been affected by the childcare crisis and thinking through ways to expand access to childcare. COVID-19 has crystallized what we already knew that our country's approach to childcare as a private family matter rather than e an economic development issue is not only an outsized strain on families, but a particular hindrance to women's professional advancement. This is something at EDC we are spending time looking at and look forward to coming back to this committee later. Our other area of focus is the network gap. When we talk about economic advancement for underserved communities, we often talk about skills training, but that's not enough. According to LinkedIn research, where you grew up, went to school, and have worked contribute to up to a 12-time advantage in access to opportunity. The network gap, while not a new problem, is a prominent one. Lack of access to strong networks has long been identified 
is a major contributor to the gender pay gap, the racial pay gap, and the underrepresentation of women and minority and senior roles and organizations. And so later this year, Women.NYC plans to launch an all virtual digital networking hub for New York City based women to target long standing gaps in networking, career opportunity, and professional development, particularly for Black and Indigenous women of color. On the platform, emerging professionals will be able to connect with established professionals from New York City companies for mentorship, coaching, and network building. Recently, we secured some private funding and currently, are reviewing tech partners via our public solicitation. We are also re-upping our public event schedule and have a busy month ahead of us. I'm doing a free workshop called It's Never Too Late to Pivot on March 10th as part of a month long series of free coaching events from an organization called the Female Quotient. On March 19th, we are partnering with LinkedIn for an event aimed at job seekers who want to expand their digital toolkits. The event consists of LinkedIn Masterclass, small group coaching, in the year of LinkedIn Learning, a platform offering online courses on in-demand tech training. And later this month, we're kicking off a series with Luminary, a co-working space, aims at forging crucial career connections when it's so challenging to do so. Like all of our events, they will be free and open to the public. I mentioned that I'm leading a pivoting workshop and I just wanna say a word about my own turn to public service from the private sector uh, more than two years ago. It took me a while to land here, nearly three decades, and I'm so grateful I did. In all my career twists and turns, I never could have imagined that my day job would be working to help make the city I love so much a place where women can thrive professionally. It's immensely rewarding work made better by my partnership with Jasmine, a New York City born and bred talent and an incredible collaborator. Thank you for offering us the opportunity to share our work. I want to thank the members of this committee, as well as city, city Hall, City Council, and EDC staff who helped bring this hearing to life. Jasmine and I are here to take any questions you may have. Thank you. I want to start by first acknowledging my colleagues, and I feel strong and empowered how I look to see a large number of my the member, committee members are men. So we're going to hold you to task <laughs> on that. I, I like to. First, start by acknowledging former and re-elected Councilman Gennaro. That thank you for joining the, the committee. is present is a present um, opportunity for me knowing that I'm I'm a new member. I'm about three months in tomorrow, so I, I will stand on your shoulders just a little bit uh, in your leadership. Uh, also, former Chair Helen Rosenthal is it's on. I I thank you, thank you for working with me as I'm transitioning and to try to fulfill your shoes. You've did amazing work and I can only hope as I move forward to, to make you proud. My understanding is that a few of my other colleagues are here. Carlo, CM Carlos, I'm gonna pronounce it the Spanish way. Maybe you can come back and just wave a little to us. I'm sure he's preparing a question or two as well. Did I miss anyone, Brenda? Uh, Council member Lander as well. Oh, I'm sure Landry will have a question or two for me or for us. I'm going to, to start with my, my first, I'm going to share with you a little bit. If you don't know, I come from the shelter system. I spent 13 years predominantly working with women in the shelter environment. And I didn't know of, of women.nyc, which I found somewhat disheartening. So I'm definitely, this is going to be a learning opportunity for me. Your presentation was quite impressive, but I'm going to need data that speaks to what I find to be the hardest struggling population for you to serve as women coming out, out of shelter. The community where I'm representing, the 37 councilmatic district, has the highest number of referrals of women into shelter. And again, you know, coming from that environment that, that's a tender place for me. Then also, I see you use the term Latinx. That's also a term that's, that's not quietly understood within my community. i like for you to break down to me. When you say Latinx, are you, break, are you able to break it down to me a little more thoroughly? Are we speaking to the Dominican population, the Puerto Rican population, the Mexican population? It's important to me to know how you're engaging with us individually as you eloquently lumped us up by, by saying um, 
putting us into uh, Latinx. If you can please start with, with the data um, and, and the shelter fabulous you've been able to engage. Okay, thank you, um, Councilwoman Diaz. I appreciate those questions. So I wanted to sort of take a second and back up and um, make clear that we, our role is to amplify existing programs through the city and also launch some of our own. We're a program of two people and um, we have amazing resources at EDC to take advantage of. I think what is really helpful about us being here is the opportunity to amplify what other city agencies are doing um, to help women, uh, whether they're coming out of the shelter systems, graduating CUNY, um, potentially coming out of community college, potentially coming out of a tech boot camp, we're here for all women of New York City, and we can't serve everybody by ourselves. But what we can do is amplify existing work of agencies and uh, other agencies in other parts of the city government. Um, so our goal is if there are programs to help women coming out of shelters, we would love to amplify those. And we also would like to make sure that women coming out of shelters have access to the programs that we have coming up, um, particularly our networking platform, our LinkedIn event, um, anything else, any of the job skills and services um, that other agencies are offering on our website. We're here to help get the word out. Um, so we don't have the capacity as a small entity, really tailor specific, the two of us alone to tailor specific programs to, um, specific populations, but we'd love to help. Um, in terms of the Latin next question, I, um, appreciate the question. I'm not sure that the survey data that we have gets as specific as you'd like it to, but I'd, I'd like to get back to you on that. Okay, and then, so it sounds to me just for my clarity, that you don't have a relationship with the Department of Homeless Services. Have you ever done a presentation? Thrive NYC was where I participated and was certified as a first responder for anyone in need of mental health. And that was something that was pushed greatly through DA, to DHS to us. So for my clarity's sake, moving forward, if you do not have a relationship with DHS, I want to make it among my priorities that we do have that conversation. I don't think it should be as women are exiting the system, that that's the first point of conversation. That should be part of, of our intake process. And that's, that's how I, I, I see it. You know, I really appreciate that. And that sounds like a great opportunity for us. You know, we need these inbound conversations and connections that's really helpful to help us do our work and we'd love to collaborate with you on that okay then getting we before i move on to one of my my colleagues that's dear your data and breaking it down by by zip code i'm really eager to know for the 37 consumatic district if you're able to bring it home for me to that just that minuteness more so because during the rezone that took place about four years ago we were promised via edc a significant amount of training and employment opportunities, and I'm not seeing that. If I understood, if I understood correctly, you mentioned opportunities in the area of trade. And with all the development that's happening in my community, I like to know if we were able to train individuals to be part of the current workforce that's needed here within my district. Maybe Ms. Nunez would sorry. Um, okay, thank you for that question also. Um, so we, you know, as I said before, um, I think you're speaking to the aspect of our website that sends people to other agencies and programs, and we don't collect data for other agencies in terms of, so if the job, you know, we'll send somebody, if there's a job training program run by another agency, we help people find out about it on the women.nyc website, but we don't track the job training numbers um, for those agencies by gender. So then how, how, how do we measure your success rate? Well, I think that there's a couple of ways to do that. I think that um, 
one of the ways that we can do that is look at the programs that we run ourselves. And I think, you know, I can talk a little bit about our success rate with the salary negotiation workshops, which was one a program that we really developed and operated and ran. You want me to tell, talk a little bit about that? I, I, I like to, because I need to walk away with, with outcomes. Okay, okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. So, the salary negotiation workshop, if I, if I have the opportunity to speak about that, was um, a, a program that was developed by the American Association of University Women. They um, approached us about rolling out the program in New York City. And the idea would be to, to educate 10,000 women in New York City in salary negotiation. Um, we had hoped for a multi-year program of in-person and online workshops. But we only got, um, we launched in September 2019. So I guess that was about six months into the program. Um, we had workshops um, in all five boroughs. We also partnered with libraries and other community organizations. And we really relied on them to get the word out to their members. And um, prior to COVID, um, we had about uh, 3,000 women enrolling across the city um, in person and online. And since COVID, we've had 3,000 more primarily online. And what was, we had about 50 to 100 uh, people at every workshop and we had two or three a week. We had 23 workshops before, before COVID. And what was really impressive about, I, I feel like that, um, what I'm proud of with that effort is that we had community partners involved. We had um, women of color facilitating in many instances. We were able to reach women in all um, five boroughs. We had a diverse cohort of women participating and it was um, free. We didn't, the city didn't have to pay for the program. We had some marketing costs and some promotion costs associated with it. Associated with it. So I feel like that is really, um, we got great feedback. I mean, it's hard to really gauge longitudinal results from salary negotiation when COVID came along a few months later. These are skills you develop over your lifetime and use over time. But um, I feel like that program is an example of how uh, effective we are able to be. Um, I, I, I appreciate your question about how do we know women.nyc is effective if we can't trace um, how many people, um, how many more people there are in say a job skills program that we advertise on our website. But this is just one entry point. We, we want women to know that these programs exist. Um, but we need everybody in the New York City ecosystem to partner with us on gender equity and making sure that women are um, accessing every opportunity available to them. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna go back to EDC at a later point because they interviewed, they made contact with 16,000 individuals in the 37 consumatic district and 13,000 intakes and claimed to have employed 810. So I'm going to try to figure out in the next couple of months if any of those 810 were exposed to to your to any of a referral to you at all. Um, thank you, thank thank you for answering my my questions and your deliverance today. I like to turn it over to chair to former chair Councilman Rosenthal who has a hand raised. Time starts now. Hi, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, I'm driving, so apologies for the lack of video. I'm not sure I really have a question. I have a, I, I just want to say, Councilmember Diaz, this transition is going to be seamless. I'm hearing your questions and your perspective. You're thinking about things that would not have been in my uh, world to even think about, and you're addressing, you're asking really the most important questions. So in a way, I'm just, I wanted to note that um, and double down on 
looking forward to the answers to the questions that council member Diaz is asking. Um, and for those who know me, I especially love the data questions. And while what I, again, really appreciate you, Councilwoman Diaz, because um, I, of course, we all know that there are qualitative services where you can't necessarily measure the outcome, right? But there are the question of you know, is and uh, women at NYC doing succeeding in its mission for all New Yorkers is such a valid one, and you know we could almost even leave it up to women at NYC to come up with what the data measures are, but and and. Bay, you started to talk about a few of them. Um, but I, I just really want to encourage you, Councilmember Diaz, to keep up that line of questioning. And I really look forward to seeing um, what, what women.nyc can pull together. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, former chair. You, former chair. I'll, I'll be calling on you nonetheless. Look forward to my texting and my emails. <laughs> thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Council Member Gennaro? Okay. Chair, we're not seeing any hands raised. We're just checking. Oh, okay. No Council Member hand raised at the moment. All right. So you all know I had a million questions to ask you, but definitely with your opening, <laughs> with your opening statement, you answered some of my questions. So. I just need a second to, <laughs> to see if you miss any of, of my points. So I'm hearing here, and then I'll be as candid as possible. One of the questions we, we discussed internally was there have been a, there's been a lot of news in reference to the Biden administration, the Gender um, Policy Council, and it's also called Gender for Women. What, what are your thoughts on that? Have you done some research, some studies? Do you see a way how you can perhaps link within that, that conversation? Uh, well, thank you for asking, Chair Diaz. I mean, I think it's very early, but boy, is it good news to have an administration that's taking gender seriously and women in the workforce and childcare. I think that we are very open to seeing how we can collaborate. And um, But I think it's it's just very early in these efforts to understand where it's going and what those opportunities look like. Okay, when you started your, your process, did you have a target number of success stories you wanted to have? Like I know for me, when I began, when I decided to participate in public service at the age of 19, I wanted to contact, be able to know that I impacted one person, one family, in a positive way, and I was able to measure my outcomes that way. Today, I'm responsible for 152,000 families in my district. So to me, short-term and, and long-term goals are important. I did not read your RFP, your, you know, how, how you all started, how you would see your measurables. Do you remember what your target number was? And if you feel you, I know you say it's hard for you to pinpoint because everything gets outsourced, but is there a somewhat of a number that you think comfortably you've been able to achieve since your original thought process? That's also a great question. Um, I would say that uh, every time we launch a program ourselves, mm -hmm. the success metrics, what does success look like is the first question that we ask. Mm -hmm. you, you know, when we're sending people all over the city ecosystem, we can't be responsible for everybody, everybody's success. But I will say that I go back to the salary negotiation workshops again, because it's the, you know, the one program that we owned ourselves entirely, right, um, as an entity, and that we were able to um, reach so many people in such a short time, I think is, um, was a success, even though we didn't um, have we weren't able to, we had to pause in-person workshops because of COVID. Um, Jasmine, do you want to talk a, a bit about some of our other numbers too that might answer Diaz's yeah. questions? Definitely. Thank you for your Thank question. You. 
says. Um, I just, you know, want to reiterate what Faye mentioned in her testimony about Women.NYC's mission and the services we provide along with how we provide them. So since our goal is to make sure that New York remains the best place in the world for women of all backgrounds, ages, and abilities, and identities to thrive in their careers, we have kind of three ways that we go about achieving that mission. Like Faye mentioned, we amplify existing New York City resources and programs from other agencies. Um, we also convene free and informative events. Um, that's something Faye also touched on. As she mentioned, we're doing a lot of, um, we've pivoted like most people have had to, to virtual events and we're launching um, quite a large slate of them this month. Um, lastly, we foster those strategic cross-sector partnerships to launch programs that are providing the real tools that women need. So that said, I think what we're trying to um, convey here is that our program metrics are varied as they're specific to those particular arms of our services and each metric is different. So like in summary, I can tell you that to date, we have 6.3 thousand um, direct participants in our programs and events. Um, our digital footprint, which is something that really comes into play when it comes to amplifying those existing resources, those metrics I can share with you here, we've had to date 207,000 website visitors and we have 30K um, people that we are reaching through social media and via email. So our digital footprint now during COVID is more important than ever. It makes it really easy for us to get out there and reach more people and share these resources in addition to information on our own programs. Thank you. Glad that we always have, um, we always need help getting the word out and would love to be able to reach your constituents or anyone's constituents with some of our upcoming programs and um, would love to be able to get in touch and if you have a newsletter, maybe you could put that, put some of these events in your newsletter so constituents are aware. Definitely. Um, I, have I may ask. Of course, I have to ask. And one was, was the possibility of us doing a webinar, a workshop, something virtually so we can promote your resources. Like I said early on, you know, for the time that I was in shelter since your program began, I had not heard of you until my committee began doing some research for our conversation here today. Then you share that you're a staff of two. And we know that funds are low, you know, resources are not uh, available, but how, do, how, do you, how, how can I possibly help you help me? Or does that mean you need more staff, you know, to collaborate with other partners? What, what, are, you, what are your financial struggles? Do you see that you could do more if you had more to work with? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I know absolutely we could do more if we had more to work with, but I think that, um, you know, given what we do have, it's, first of all, you know, EDC has marketing department and PA and I'm sorry, that's, that's comms um, and legal. So we do have the sort of, it's not Jasmine and I alone, we're part of, of EDC. Um, and I think that we, we're pretty scrappy, right? We know how to, we kind of do everything ourselves as much as possible. Um, but absolutely, I think that the, the, what we'd love to grow, of course, but we'd love to, to help get the word out. If you hear about something that women of New York City need to know about, let us know. Maybe we'll, maybe it's a constituent doing something really cool that should be featured on our social networks. Maybe it's a program that's happening that, that we need to know about. You know, we're here for all of New York City. And, you know, as the more partners, the more um, folks that help us get the word out, but also help send us inbound resources and information, the, the better we'll be. Okay, so I'm going to allow you to help me get the word out. Great, and okay. E EDC right now are not, and I are not at the best terms based on the commitment that they made to my community. So I'm going to figure out how we can be better partners, get your word out there with, with what you provide and also EDC with some of the deliverables that I'm being up, beat up about <laughs> that we haven't received. Um, thank you, th th thank you again for, for your time and, and your effort and look forward to hearing some more on, on the data. Brenda, turning it back to you. Excellent, thank you, Chair. We're just gonna check um, if there are any other council members that have questions, there are no hands raised, but if you have questions for the administration, please let us know. 
We're not seeing any hands in Zoom or literally physically. So um, we will move to the public panels. Thank you so much to the administration. Um, so at this point, uh, we have concluded the administration's testimony. For members of the public, please note, I will call up individuals and panels. And because we have one panel, I will call the names of everyone on the panel and then I will call you individually. Um, council members, if you have questions for a particular witness or panelists, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and we will call on you on the order that you raised your hand. And for panelists, please note once your name is called, um, a member of our staff will unmute you, that box will pop up to accept it and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin, at which point you may begin your testimony we will be using a three minute clock today. Um, so just a re reminder to wait for the Sergeant at Arms. So at this point, I will read the members of the panel. Um, so we have three witnesses today. Those witnesses are Laura Rebel Gross from Student Leadership Network, Christian F. Nunes from the National Organization for Women, or now, and Cordell Clear. Uh, so our first witness will be Laura Rebel Gross. You may begin once the sergeant calls the clock. Time starts now. Our first. Just one moment, apologies. Uh, just technical difficulties. Just one, one moment, please. Okay, we will go to our second panelist, um, Ms. Nunes, Christian F. Nunes from the National Organization for Women. Um, you may begin once the sergeant calls the clock. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you all. Good morning, members of the Council and Committee on Women, Gender, Equity. Um, as I said, my name is Christian Nunes, president of National Organization for Women. Uh, I want to thank Councilman Dinos for this time and inviting me to share a few words. I just really want to talk really and talk clearly about why this important issue is a feminist issue for the National Organization for Women and some of the work that we are trying to do legislatively um, to combat the impact of housing and homelessness on BIPOC, which is Black, Indigenous, Persons of Color, Latinx women, um, and TG non, TGNC, which is uh, transgender nonconforming women and those identify as women. So I just wanted to start off by just talking about what we've been through this last year in 2020. Um, over the last year in 2020, you know, the United States has been hit with two crossing pandemics, the global health pandemic of COVID-19 that took more than 500 million, um, 500,000 lives and racial injustice for many BIPOC communities, including like, sense of deaths we've seen of unarmed black and brown bodies and individuals and xenophobic attacks on AAPI communities. But in both these situations, what we have witnessed is a desperate impact on women and girls, but those are also consequential gender equalities that come from those, those um, results we've seen from these pandemics. So over COVID, I mean, Councilman, uh, Councilman Diaz clearly started saying this, that we've seen that especially women of color have been greatly affected by COVID. In December alone, in December 2020, there were 144,000 jobs lost. All of them were by women. And women are usually primary caregivers, so unemployment for women can particularly hit hard during times like this. And we know loss of income is a contributing factor to homelessness, and without a home, it is very difficult to get adequate resources needed to find a new employment, to find childcare, to find a car, to find the necessary things to have a sustainable life. And there is also a very obvious disconnect with the assistance and the services provided to families. Research was showing, we looked it up right here in New York City, uh, in New York, their monthly assistance is $789. But however, the average monthly two bedroom apartment rent is $3,600. That means a person would have to work four, four and a half times in order just to cover their rent. And that is not including the cost of just living day to day for food and clothing and housing and other needs. So we know housing inequality has gotten worse through the pandemic and has really hit, in black, hit the Black communities and Latinx communities harder with higher rates of high housing hardships due to evictions, foreclosures, um, rent and mortgage delinquencies and utility payments. And also, we also know that due to this lockdown um, that come with the pandemic, we've seen an increase in domestic and intimate partner violence and child abuse. 
And in some of these situations, those individuals, those women and children felt like the only option they had was to leave their home. Time expired. And Can we please give her more time? Okay. Thank you. So there's a lot of statistics, so we can go on and on about the statistics, but I think what we clearly want to understand is that housing is a feminist issue because it talks about the intersex of oppression that women are experiencing from their gender, from their sex, from their race, from the economic disadvantage. And that now we are working really hard to work locally and federally and legislative advocacy to help change policies and laws and, and acts and help get bills passed that will really make sure they're inclusive for women. And a lot of times we have to look at housing policies have not been from the place of a woman's standpoint or what or from the place of children. And so it's really important. And we've partnered um, with National Coalition for Homelessness to really work on launching a campaign that will be very inclusive for the needs of women and children. And we're really excited about that. And we will continue working with other organizations like Wiggle Momentum here that provides a help hotline um, for anyone that's discriminating gender, domestic, domestic or discrimination violence, sexual violence or gender violence abuse in their homes or workplace. And I also would be remiss if I didn't talk about our New York State chapter and our New York City chapter who've been doing extreme work on the state and local level to really truly bring forth changing laws so that we can help impact and, and create a sustainable and safe life for these women. So we have to look at this as a holistic perspective. We cannot address um, gender equity, if we're not looking at the whole system and how it impacts a woman. And now it's here to continue working with common cause coalitions and allies to do this work um, through education, legislative advocacy, and activism. So I will stop there um, so that I save my time. Thank you. You, you th Thank you for your presentation. You definitely you spoke to my heart. <laughs> you know, um, women, gender equity, and, and I know I'm being redundant, but spending 13 years with working with men, women and knowing, you know, that feeling when I was able to go sign a lease with one of my families or give them the keys as a sense of freedom and independence, you know, so, so thank you. Thank you for being on today. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for the data, you know, because this is something that's, that's being streamed and I'm hoping someone out there is listening to our plight. You know, as I said earlier, we have the highest number of referrals into the shelter system, which trickles down to our little people, right? We're our foundation. If you don't have a home, you don't have a place, right? I, I experienced homelessness at the age of 19 and a half. I was a young mom. It was an experience for about a month, you know, but nonetheless, it was my experience, that sense of, of not knowing you know, thankfully I was able to secure a permanent place and I was there for 18 years, but that allowed me to put myself in a path where I wanted to have a stable home for my daughter. So when my husband died and my daughter was nine, that took me even to a stronger saying, Dharma, you have to figure this out. You know, you're, you're really on your own. That support that I thought I would have forever and a day in raising my daughter was no longer there. That was where I figured out a way by creativity, having programs available to me, having resources makes me, uh, allow me to be a homeowner today, you know? And when my daughter, I'm, I'm a grandma and seeing Zachary in my home, you know, has allowed me to fulfill my mission, but more because I understood that I did not want my daughter to face displacement. Having a landlord saying you have to move because you're pregnant it's inhumane. And then you have to move again because your baby cries. You know, so I, and those are stories that my women shared with me, you know, while, while in the shelter, you know, and not, not everyone falls into the shelter system because they want to. Now, it's not always the fault, you know, of. So in able, you know, I'm hoping that we will continue to work together. Ms. Nunez, it was nice meeting you, <laughs> even though it is virtually, but I, I believe in, in your mission. And I believe we have a lot of work to do. So again, thank you for participating here today. I'd like to know if any of my cohorts, if there's any of the council members on there would like to ask a question or have a comment. No. Okay, again, thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for making me feel empowered. And it's good to know that when I'm at ground zero, you're at ground 100 fighting the fight 
because it has to trickle down and we'll meet in the middle. Like Please thank always you. reach out as well. <laughs> oh, I will. Okay. I will. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, Chair, we have one more witness um, today, Cordell Clear. Looks like uh, they're ready to testify. Wonderful. Uh, good, mor good morning. Time starts now. Oh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Good morning. I just wanted to lend my voice of support uh, to uh, women and gender e equity uh, in my district. I live in Harlem. And I participate in many um, advocacy efforts and organizing efforts to uh, grow opportunities for women, especially women in business and women in small business. Um, and, I, and that includes uh, vendors, uh, that includes entrepreneurs. Um, a lot of women, especially during this pandemic, have found it hard to provide for their families these are not just single women that, you know, in our community, everybody has to work. <laughs> the, the, the household has to work. And we really have to empower women in a way that they can get an opportunity to open businesses, to grow businesses. And the sister that was speaking before, I totally agree with, you know, the opportunities being made for mothers, women who have children. I'm, I myself uh, spent a, a period of time um, in a shelter uh, with my family, and it is just that much harder. It's very difficult to do that, uh, you know, to to make a living, to to try to create opportunities to get yourself out of the situation that you're in. So I just want to support women getting funding opportunities, women getting contracts, women uh, getting business opportunities. I recently worked on a with a group of women to try to get a a, a female architect, um, uh, a contract, uh, and, and, and a female artist uh, to get a contract. You know, they're just, when we do have these skills and we do have these talents, it's very hard to get ourselves out there. Uh, so I think that we have to make some really deliberate and purposeful efforts to reach out to women, to find women uh, in a world that's often dominated by men. Thank you. Thank you, thank you immensely for sharing your story and also your struggle. This is 2021. Yes. Your struggle shouldn't be so big, but it also goes to the men at the table. Yes. Right? Let's not talk about it, let's be about it. Yes. You know, if you're really with us and you understand your plight as men, I'm gonna challenge you. The next time you're looking to an architect, here we have a sister in the struggle who's saying, hey, I'm equipped. Yes. I know someone that's equipped. And, and that's what it has to be about. You know, I, I'm not going to bash men because it's not you know, who I am, but I am going to use the word challenge to ask you to bring us to the table. You know, th th there's been a lot of conversation on how we should be working together. Well, then let's make it happen. Let's, yes. let's, let's make measurable. Six months from now, I would like to be in a conversation where we have a couple of men coming on you know, to hearing and saying, we heard you. We heard you and so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so and, and this is where we are. We landed the contract. And when it comes to, to gender and, and equity, you know, transgender folks, I, I hear you, you know, and, and it bothers me that employment opportunities are made that much harder for you. It should be about your resume, how you present well. So please know that in Dharma, and I'm going to say Dharma because that's how I want folks to see me as the individual that's transitioned from the voice to not being at the table. My, my committee in the next couple of hearings will we'll be discussing employment and opportunities and the disadvantages that need to be flipped to our favor. You know, we're born who we are. We're going to take our toolbox and we're going to run with it. You know, so 2021, we're here. We're here, we're strong, we're proud. We're gonna to continue to have these conversations. Cordell Clear, thank you. Thank, thank you for coming on. It's, I'm sure it wasn't easy to get up this morning and, and say, I'm gonna tell my story. And for you know, being in the shelter system and talking about it, it's humbling. So thank you. I, I know that from my point, when I was a case manager and, and that three titles in one, I always told my clients, I'm here today, but I could be where you are tomorrow. You know, and I hope that your experience where you were was similar 
to the experiences that my clients had when I was in the shelter system. To this day, um, they text me, they call me, they let me know when they're okay. I've gotten emails unexpectedly from Ms. Diaz, thank you. You know, so I'm, I'm hoping for you as well that you have your transitions in, into a solid place and you're not scarred in any way. Because I, I know not each provider has the mm -hmm. best staff and understands what it is when you have a child and you can't make it in on time and you have to be creative and have two jobs so you can qualify for a voucher. And during the pandemic, I know it's been real tough. So to DHS, if you're out there, I'm listening, I'm paying attention. I may not be on staff, but I know the struggle that my families, my clients continue to suffer. Vouchers are difficult to achieve and during COVID even harder to be processed. So I, again, I, I'm gonna thank all my panelists, but Cordell, stay strong. And if any conversation has impacted me, it, it's, it's been yours because it hits home. Thank you so much. Thank you for saying that. And it didn't scar me and I rose to great heights, Good. but it is, it is, it, it, it is uh, a disability of such. Uh, it's not just being a woman. There's also the stigmatizing from being homeless and people not understanding that this is not a condition that you want for yourself. Uh, you know, no one wants to be there. Trust me. Um, but we did get out of the situation and there were some good people and there were some not so good people on that path, but everybody doesn't have uh, the opportunities maybe that I had. And I, I respect you for the work that you do for home, that you've done for homeless families and for incorporating that into what you're uh, doing right now uh, is so important for us to realize that everybody's just trying to make it. And it's very tough for women to get out there and make it. And especially that's just another barrier when you're homeless and you don't have a place to live. It's just another judgment that people put on you. And it becomes a disability, just like womanhood and motherhood, all mm -hmm. those things people put on us. So I appreciate this message. I appreciate what you're doing and your colleagues. And um, I just look forward to change. Well, you're, you're part of the change. You're leading the way. You're here today, you're talking about it. And for full disclosure, I also I was um, experienced NYPD staff mm. and FDNY and, and EMS, mm. social mm. workers, you know, people that were gainly employed, but were evicted, you know, or just were in a bad situation or DV, you know, I got men with me in the shelter, yes. you know, men that took on that, the feminine role, we're going to call it that based on how society dictates, right? Where mm -hmm. the male now takes on being the mommy and me and, and the daddy. And I share right. it as well, because it sometimes we're just one paycheck away, or That's one right. bad conversation away or someone at home, that's something for mental illness. And we just got to get away. We just got to get away. Uh, then again, th thank you all. I don't know if anyone else has, has a comment. I'm sure we have enough time. If there's something that one of the, the panelists said or not able to say some clarity, I'd like to give you a minute or two to come back with before we close. I think Ms. Nunez. Can you hear Ms. me? Nunez? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to add that I also think it's really important that we understand that in order to change this um, housing crisis that we're having, not only in New York, but like in America, we have to look at um, it's more things than just providing transitional housing. It's about providing childcare. It's about providing a, a sustainable living wage. You know, there's multiple parts that go into this. And it really is up to all of us on not only like this, the federal level, but also the local and state levels to make sure that we're passing ordinances, passing programs um, that really are gonna help our families, help our women, um, help our children. So we can't look at housing just as a home. I mean, a home is more than that. It's more holistic than that. And it's really important the services that we provide or wrap around and provide all those things. So I'm also a social worker background. So, yeah. <laughs> so I have a little of that, but I just think we have to look at that from a child care, paid family medical leave, paid sick leave, all those things together can make it for a person to be able to have a livable, sustainable and safe life. And, and that's what 
can do. It's not just a home, a roof over your head. So I just wanted to add that point. So when we're thinking about services and wraparound, we're looking at it from a holistic perspective and everyone's needs. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to just go back. Is, e, e, oh, no, is Women NYC still on? Do we still have them, Brenda? I don't see members of the administration, Chair. Okay. What I'd like to do is, if it's okay, I'd like to forward the questions that I did not ask. I, I thought that they were going to be somewhat challenging for them. A lot of it is data driven and, and specifics to detail that I was made to feel they were not going to be able to answer the questions. But I will give categories to where we were going to emphasize on was I have more questions in the area of engagement, advertisement, which obviously I feel is lacking, the resources, employment, more of the target database, which I asked for, small business and entrepreneurships, workshops, and then a program, she built NYC. So once I receive the answers to these questions, I will share with my audience today and I'll, I'll make it public on my website. And thank you. Brenda, back to you. Okay, thank you so much, Chair Diaz. Um, so we'll just check before, this is the end of panel one. Um, so before we move on to check for any witnesses we might have inadvertently missed, um, I just wanna check if there's any other questions. We don't have council member hands. Um, so at this point, we have concluded public testimony, Chair Diaz. So uh, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, and is logged in, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in the order that your hand is raised. So we're just checking, I'm just waiting for hands and we're not seeing any. Okay, Chair Diaz, um, at this point we have concluded public testimony for the hearing. If I may, before we close, I'd like to, what I used earlier as my gavel was what we call a, uh, a belong, which in my culture, we, we used to mash, it could be our garlic, it could be we make our sofrito. And I share something where I think we should collaborate more as a people. I, I use the, a platano, which is, a, which is a, a, a green plantain. I say Puerto Ricans make mofongo out of it, Dominicans make mangu. And my Honduran sister tells me they make chips out of it. I share that to say that we need to collaborate. And that's my bottom line. I see New York moving forward if we share our resources. So if I, if I can end it on a happy note, it's just share, share, share. Let's figure out a way to make this happen. I'm gonna go home and try to make some sofrito because my daughter would like some. <laughs> Thank you. Until next time. Again, th thanking all my, all my staff, Brenda and Chloe, Richard, Karen Cherry, the sergeant, if I've avoided anyone, it's. As, as my as Karen says, judge, judge my heart, not my head. And to Speaker Corey Johnson, thank you for the opportunity to chair this committee. Thank you. Madam Chair, we need you to officially gavel out with our pilong. Oh my goodness. I'm gonna. <laughs> thank you.